Good morning. Glad to see you all here today. It is in the strength of Jesus that we put our trust, and it is in his might that we gather here today. Glad that you're here this morning. This is going to be our our last lesson in this series on the letter to the Ephesians. I just wanted to say that I have really enjoyed uh, going through this letter with you and sharing each week in the lessons that it shares with us. I hope that it's been useful to you. We're going to spend more one more week here in Ephesians this morning. Now to me, there is no worse feeling, or at least not many worse feelings in the world than the feeling of being underprepared, or worse than that, flat out unprepared. Would you agree? There, there are a few worse feelings than that feeling in your gut that just hits you and you say, ooh, I was not ready for this. I have felt that feeling a time or two or, or three or four in my life, and I felt it enough to know that I do not like when I feel that way. Sometimes it comes with complimentary gifts, like sopping wet hair and soggy socks and shoes and no umbrella in sight. Uh, sometimes it comes with a knock at the door and, and grandma's standing there unannounced and the living room is all a mess. Or sometimes you're driving down, racing to get to an appointment and that pesky train schedule at Denton Highway doesn't want to cooperate. You're just sitting there, wasn't prepared for this. You know, I've heard that one of the most common nightmares that people have is a nightmare about being unprepared for a speech or for a pop quiz or for a a final exam. Maybe it's all the emphasis we put on star tests and SATs, I, I don't know. But apparently people that have been out of school for 20 years, 30 years, maybe one of you has had this dream before, you'll go to sleep and suddenly you're back in geometry class and the final exam is sitting right in front of you and you have no idea how to solve for X. Sitting there at that desk, it's not a good feeling. I have personally never had that dream. For me, it's not a desk, it's a podium that looks strangely like this one. Go analyze that. I'm standing there with nothing. Nothing prepared, nothing to say. It's not a good feeling. Wherever it may come from, final exam, a flat tire, filing your taxes. We hate that feeling of being unprepared. And so we try, I'm sure all of us do, in many ways to never feel that feeling in our lives. You set an extra alarm in the morning to make sure you're up on time. You put every event in your calendar because you don't want to miss a beat. You got to buy that extra warranty for this and everything in the world needs insurance for that. And and you got to put a little extra cash in your wallet just in case. So much time, so much money, so much effort, so much thought is put into making sure that we're ready, that we're prepared. And yet with all of these things in our lives and the real things pressing on us, saying, be ready. Our passage this morning tells us that there is one thing that stands out above the rest. One thing that demands most of all that we be ready. That we be prepared. And sometimes, as important as that is, sometimes it can even go overlooked. Our passage this morning, our last one from Ephesians, tells us that in the end, there is one struggle, one battle that all human beings must face. And this one struggle is the one place where it matters most in our lives that we are prepared. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Here we find something like a call to arms. And it's calling us to be ready. Let's read, beginning in verse 10. Ephesians says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle 
is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. So let's walk back through what we've just read here in just a moment. You see how in this passage we are called to do what? We are called here to stand firm, to be ready. To be ready to resist. To be ready to stand strong. Why? Because, verse 11, verse 12... There is one struggle that is greater and weightier and more consequential than all of the rest that we face in life. Our struggle, this passage says, when you get down to it, is not just those things that we see before us. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Not above all is it that. Our struggle is what? spiritual one. Our struggle is against the spiritual forces of wickedness in this world and beyond it. As we live and breathe today, we face a spiritual struggle. A struggle for our souls that goes beyond just flesh and blood and goes beyond what meets the eye and goes beyond all of those other little things, important things that are pressing on us to be prepared. We wrestle and we battle with something even greater. The problem of sin. The problem of wickedness in this world and the way that it has power over even sometimes our hearts. This is our struggle says Ephesians chapter 6. And notice, by the way, that it is our struggle. Not just your struggle or my struggle. Because as surely as we live and breathe, all of us are swept into this struggle with the schemes of the devil, as verse 11 says. In one way or another, we're all kind of caught up in this battle. And so all of us together are called to be prepared. Prepared to do what this passage calls us to do. Prepared to be ready. Prepared to stand firm. Prepared to do all of those things, whatever we may be able to do to resist the power of sin in this world and in our lives. You see, the first thing this passage does for us is it awakens us to the struggle, right? To the danger, to the problems and the powers that we face in this world, the spiritual significance of our lives. It is like that bugle that sounds over tents and trenches before the the sun has dawned. It says, wake up, be alert, be ready. Because it's more than a little tragic when we're ready for every board meeting and every pop quiz and everything we may face on our calendars. But we forget about this real and pressing struggle, this real battle that we all find ourselves in. So the passage says it's time, folks. It's time to take your spiritual self seriously. If you're not doing that already, it's time to wake up and stand firm in the Lord. So the first thing this passage does is it says, be prepared. Our struggle, it's not just against flesh and blood. And then after this passage has awakened us to that and told us to be prepared, it doesn't just leave us there, but it shows us how. It shows us the way. God doesn't just simply awaken us to this struggle, but he also provides for us what we need in order to be able to stand. And so twice in this passage, Really, in just the first three verses, two times, the passage is going to say to us, put on the whole armor of God. Take up the whole armor of God. This is what you're going to need if you're going to be able to stand. 
And then if you know the passage, you know it goes on to explain in this really beautiful illustration what that really looks like. Verse 14, stand firm then, having girded your loins with truth. A a more contemporary way to say that might be put the belt of truth around your waist. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet, prepared or readied your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So this is what it means when it says take up the full armor of God. It means taking up truth and righteousness and the gospel and faith and salvation and the Word of God as if your life depended on it. Because it does. And so it says take up these things like the armor that you you need. We're given this picture where truth and righteousness and peace and faith and salvation and the Word of God... They are that which equips us and protects us against the schemes of the devil. These things, truth and righteousness and faith and salvation, there are tools for survival. They're the essentials of living and enduring in this fight. They're the kind of things you wouldn't go out without them. You know, as I was listening to this passage and preparing for it, it reminded me of my short-lived football career. If you blinked, you probably missed it. I was in middle school, and I remember the days of going into the locker room before practice or before a game, and you put on all kinds of pads and protection, thigh pads, knee pads, shoulder pads, big helmet up on your head, and even little things too, like you had to have that little mouthpiece that goes between your teeth, and you had to have those cleats on the bottom of your shoes. It was kind of a chore to get ready for practice and for a game every time. It wasn't like basketball where you could just lace them up and go, a real man's sport. That's what I told myself (laughs) when I quit football. (laughs) But even the toughest, strongest, fiercest football player wouldn't dream of going out on the field without every one of those things, even the little things like the mouthpiece that goes between your teeth. It wouldn't be some great sign of toughness If you went out on the field without those things to protect you, it would just be really asking for trouble, asking for injury, and for no reason at all. It's all right there for you, provided for you, so that you can be prepared. And in a very real way, this passage is telling us that same thing, which is that in this spiritual battle that we face, to neglect these things, righteousness and truth and faith and the Word of God, It's like going out onto a battlefield in gym shorts and with a BB gun. It's like going out onto a football field in your baseball cap and t-shirt. It's not tough. It's certainly not helpful. It's really just asking for trouble. It's really just making yourself vulnerable. And for what reason? For what purpose? So the pastor says, be prepared. Knowing that we are in this struggle that's not against flesh and blood and that it's a battle with the power of sin. Don't be the tough guy who says, I can do it myself. I have been the tough guy who says, I can do it myself. Don't be the one who relies on your own self-sufficiency. Instead, take up these things that God has provided for you. These things that God has given to you so that you may be able to stand. So how do we do that? If we say that really we are in this struggle that's not against flesh and blood, and if we know that we've been given this armor of God and it's those great qualities and things and we ought to take them up in our lives, what does it actually mean to take these things up in our lives? What does it actually mean to put on this armor of God like this passage is calling us to do? Now, this is the part in the sermon where if you've heard this passage a thousand times, and a few of you have, and if ever since you were four years old, you've been doing the little Sunday school worksheets and coloring the things, and you remember the flannel graphs with the armor of God, and some of you do, maybe this is the time to tune back in and and pay attention because 
to me, there are two lessons here that this passage teaches us about what it means and what it takes to put on this armor. And one of them, like some of you, I feel like I got at a young, young age. It's the one that people would tell me and the one that stuck with me about this armor of God. And the other one is one that maybe I didn't really consider so much until more recently. But I think both of them are important. So here's the first one, the first lesson, the one that I remember from when I was even really young. If this armor of God really is a belt of truth, if it's a breastplate of righteousness, if it's feet made ready with the gospel, if it's a shield of faith and and so on, if it's those things, then I need to be seeking those things, truth and righteousness and faith and the word of God in my life. I need to be working on those things in my life. That's how I take up this armor and stand firm. That's pretty simple. Maybe you do remember that from when you were a kid. But maybe it's also the lesson that you need to hear today if you're struggling in this battle against the devil's schemes and you haven't dusted off your sword in a while, that sword which is the word of God, well, maybe that's what this passage is calling you to do. And if you're in your life you're dealing with a faith that is weakened by doubts and uncertainties and you're vulnerable, like a soldier without a sword, then maybe it's pretty clear what this passage is nudging you toward. Because if these, if the armor of God is made up of these things, by all means, I ought to be seeking those things in my life, searching for them, practicing them, doing all that I can to be covered by them like the armor that we need. So that's the first lesson, to be prepared. We've got to seek these things with our lives. And yet there's still something else that this passage is teaching us. Something that I might not have paid much attention to before. And it's that when it comes to putting on this armor of God, actually the first and most important step is to put on Christ himself. To put on the armor of God means putting on Christ being clothed with Christ because at the end of the day it is God's armor not ours and it is God's righteousness and God's truth and the Lord's gospel and and God's salvation and God's word that is going to help us to stand even when my strength may fail because only when we have Christ on us Only when we have put on Christ in our lives, only then are we really ready to stand against the devil's schemes. After all, this is what Ephesians has been telling us if we've been listening. Do you remember when in chapter 4 it told us that if you're in Christ, you're going to put off your old self and put on a new self created not by you but by God, and that is going to bring true righteousness and holiness to your life, the kind of righteousness that doesn't come from you, the righteousness that comes through the blood of Christ covering you. Paul, in another letter, talks about spiritual armor. In in Romans 13, he talks about casting off the works of darkness and putting on the armor of light. And in that passage, equivalent to putting on the armor of light is nothing less than putting on Jesus Christ putting on the Lord Jesus Christ himself in our lives. To put on this armor begins with putting on Christ Jesus. He is our armor of light. To put on the armor of God means putting on Jesus himself. Only then are we going to be ready to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Because after all, it was the strength of the Lord's might that raised Jesus up from the dead, Ephesians says, and seated him at the right hand of God. And it is that same strength, that same might, that will be at work on your behalf 
when you are clothed with Christ. Only then are we ready to stand firm. And stand we will. Like Moses on that day when he was by the Red Sea and the great Egyptian army was crashing in on him. Do you remember this? They've just exited Egypt, or they're about to, and they're at the Red Sea. And the great Egyptian army comes crashing down the hill in their chariots, and the whole camp is drawn into this frenzy, and Moses stands up among them, and he says, don't be afraid. Stand firm, because the Lord is going to fight for you. You need only to be still. And so it can be for us if we have put on Christ in our lives. Even though our strength may fail, and even when we've done all we can and still we falter, the strength of our mighty God never falters. The God who is our shield and our protection will be with you. And His righteousness is strong. His salvation is secure. He will deliver us and we'll see it. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to stand. To stand in the strength of his might. Maybe today it's time for you to put on Christ in your life, which in the New Testament is one of the ways that we talk about being baptized into his name Galatians says that as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ in their lives, been clothed with Christ, like one who is clothed in the armor of God and ready to stand in his victory. So this invitation today that we offer is an opportunity for you if you need to put on Christ in your life to do that to surrender yourself, to be baptized in his name, to put on Christ today and stand in the strength that only he provides. Maybe for others of us, we need to be drawn near to our God in prayer that he might give us strength to stand firm and to stand with him. However you may be called or challenged by this message, let's respond while we stand and while we sing.